This talk um, we have titled Unpacking the Complexity of Evidence in Evidence-Based Practice. I'm Dave Nichols. Um, later you're going to hear from Fiona Moffat and Jerry Durham. Um, before I get into the presentation itself, let me just move forward here. And just a couple of things to say. First of all, you'll notice um, as I'm talking, I might be looking this way a little bit. I was just saying that we, I'm using two screens. And so um, a lot of my notes are over here. So apologies if during the talk you look at the video of me and I'm looking that way. That's, that's the reason why. Um, a couple of thank yous to start with, first of all, to Matt and to Mark for the invitation um, to, do, to be involved in this project and to uh, do this talk. And um, for Mark, for the considerable help he's put in, in, in actually bringing us together. Um, to Fiona and Jerry, thanks for the time we've spent over the last few months in preparing for this project. It's been lovely to spend time um, working on it together. Um, and to all the other participants in, in the course, it's, it's, an, it's an amazing opportunity to bring all of these people together. And to you, as uh, if you're tuning in to listen to this, thanks for your time um, in, in giving us this, uh, this opportunity to speak about some of this stuff. Um, as I say, my name is Dave Nichols. I'm a professor of um, physiotherapy at uh, Auckland University of Technology in Auckland, New Zealand. Um, it's 7am in Auckland today as I'm talking to you. Um, as well as working at AUT as a professor, I'm also the founder of the Critical Physiotherapy Network, which is an organisation for the last six years that's bring, attempting to bring together people who think critically about physiotherapy. Um, as a part of that um, project, I wrote a book a couple of years ago called The End of Physiotherapy, which sounds uh, slightly nihilistic, the title, but the, the book is an attempt to try and understand how we've arrived as a profession at this point in our history, where the profession is right now and where it might be going. Um, and actually, evidence-based practice forms a, an interesting part of that book, some of the critique in that book. And my interests, I suppose, are in things like um, critical history and sociology and applying things like philosophy to physiotherapy. And these are areas that historically haven't really been given a lot of emphasis in curricula and in scopes of practice. Um, what I want to do today is give a very brief overview of what's a very complex issue. And what you'll hear, I think, from Fiona and Jerry and me is that we are only really able to touch the, the access the tip of an iceberg of a, of a massive issue around the place of uh, evidence-based practice in physiotherapy from a critical point of view. Um, there's a lot of stuff that we're gonna to have to skip over here and I'm sure that's true for Fiona and Jerry. If there's anything that you want us to explain more or follow up on, our contact details are, are here and you can get in touch with us uh, directly if you want to. So let's, um, I've got to move quickly through a lot of stuff here. I've got four or five really important points that I want to make and so I'm gonna to have to move re reasonably quickly. Um, rather than the first point that I'd like to make is that we seem to spend a lot of time thinking about how we can tweak evidence-based practice to make it better. But I think there's a more fundamental question to ask here, which is whether we should be using evidence-based practice at all, what evidence-based practice tells us about the system that we now operate in. It's obviously something that has a recent history. It's not something that's existed forever. And we should be asking ourselves the, the most, perhaps for me, one of the most important critical questions, which is why this, why now? And I think we have to consider the fact that evidence-based practice is actually functioning as a sort of toxic poison in healthcare. And this is a very strong thing to say, and it's a difficult thing to argue for, particularly if you've never thought about it in that way. So I apologize if um, I have to only tackle this quite briefly. The first point I would suggest is that evidence-based practice, you only need something like that if you have a mechanized industrial healthcare system. In pre-industrial times, we lived, um, we didn't have organized healthcare. Health was something you just engaged in. It was a normal part of life. Health and illness was not something that was in the hands of specialists and experts. But when you abstract health away and you create a healthcare system and in a kind of industrial healthcare model, it then induces a whole set of secondary effects, measurements and processing units and cost benefit analyses. It's no accident that evidence-based practice has appeared on the healthcare scene at the same time as neoliberalism and managerialism and the bureaucratization of healthcare. These things come together. And that's because they're part of a, of a they're a symptom of what 
I think is increasingly being seen as a broken system. Um, so we should be asking when we're looking at evidence-based practice, not whether it can be made better, but what is it a symptom of in the first place? And I think there's a strong case to be made that um, evidence-based practice is symptomatic of, all, of a lot of the things that we now think are problematic in, in healthcare. I've interspersed this uh, few slides with a few quotes, which I really like, and a lot of them come from evidence-based medicine, and a lot of them are related to um, the problems that evidence-based medicine has, but they do apply, I think, to evidence-based practice more broadly. And this quote says, today, evidence-based medicine is a loaded gun at clinicians' heads. You better do as the evidence says, it hisses, leaving no room for discretion or judgment. And that point about leaving no room for discretion or judgment is an important point I want to come to shortly. Evidence-based medicine is now the problem fueling overdiagnosis and overtreatment. So one of the points I want to make is that evidence-based practice is neither obvious nor necessary. It's a historical invention, it resides in a particular time period, and it's an effect of certain ways of thinking. It's essentially di quite diagnostic of the system we have now. Um, we have to, we've got to be able to think past the assumption that evidence-based practice is anyway justifiable or right on any level. And I would argue that evidence-based practice is actually a, um, a violence, it's an abstraction, it's intrusive, and it's hugely problematic in healthcare as we understand it. So now that demonstrating the efficacy of our work, being on message, measuring every action, accounting for your clinical decision-making, becomes something that you do, it's an action that you do, rather than something that's just implicit in caring for people. So we've turned care into a problem of control and management and lost really what healthcare was always about. And this David Hanna quote, I think, is really, really useful. All organisations are perfectly designed to get the results we get. So in other words, we have created this beast in the manner in which it's now living and performing. And it's, but it's something that we can uncreate, we can shift and change away from. So again, just to reiterate, for me, evidence-based practice is part of a system of healthcare that many of us now find oppressive or unfair and inequitable, and it demands then that we have to put all these secondary steps in place. It's a symptom of everything we now think is wrong in healthcare, and most of all, it's a symptom of people's loss of trust in us as practitioners. The solution to um, evidence-based practice problem then is, is not to give us more time to care for people, it's to do more measurement and increasingly undervalue our own clinical decision making, which is important when you look at this quote from Stuart Murray and Dave Holmes. It evacuates ethical decision making, and I can't emphasize that phrase enough, that it evacuates ethical decision making. When you standardize care, when you put criteria around what is good care and imply that that standard could be operationalized globally, then you take away the critical function of a health professional, which is to make judgments in the moment about what this person needs. Another point I'd like to make about it, just moving again quite quickly through this, we like to think of evidence-based practice as bringing some kind of neutrality, some neutral, objective, value-free judgment about what is right and what is wrong. Evidence-based practice is never neutral. It's never objective. We use it to communicate some very particular things about physiotherapy, and we completely deny other aspects of it. That has nothing to do with evidence. Evidence-based practice always exists in a particular context, and people are very selective about how it's used. And I've got three very quick examples. There is considerable evidence now that the social determinants of health, things like um, poverty, people's educational attainment, people's access to healthcare, food security, and exposure to pollution, uh, uh, discrimination, are the, perhaps the most significant determinants of a person's long-term health. And yet physiotherapy has focused almost entirely on a behaviorism when it comes to things like um, healthcare these days. We are focusing on people doing the work for themselves. In all of the emergence about um, a lot of the work around chronic pain, a lot of the focus is on the behavioral approach towards pain. 
the social dimensions of health are significantly more powerful as determinants of long-term health than what are called the soft targets of people's individual actions. And yet it's, we don't focus on the evidence for the social determinants. We focus on the evidence from, for a whole section of healthcare, which, is le- which has much weaker evidence base to it. A second example. You would think, given all of the evidence for accidental injuries and particularly around the areas of concussion at the moment, that physiotherapists would be advocating for the end of contact sports, end of all contact sports, because they constantly cause injuries. We don't make that argument, of course, though, because that's what brings in our income. So we choose not to advocate for that. We choose to not take a strong stand on concussion and say that physios are totally against um, any sports that cause head injuries because of course it's our income stream. So we deny that evidence completely and argue instead the much weaker argument that sport is good for health. And then a third example, if you look at the opioid crisis in America, and it's not something, it's a feature of populations around the rest of the world, but it's nothing like the issue that it's been in America. And of course, one of the big issues in the opioid crisis is the public's complete loss of trust in the medical profession who have been over-prescribing these opioid drugs in bucket loads. I heard a a statistic the other day that said that in Oklahoma, which I think has a very small population, maybe 4 million or maybe um, one of the cities in Oklahoma, I'm not quite sure of the exact details, and maybe that tells you something about my attitude to evidence. Um, 76 million prescriptions were given for a population of 4 million people. Now, that has nothing to do with the evidence or the efficacy for opioid drugs. It has a lot to do with the fact that medical professions saw an income stream that it could exploit. And now it's being caught up. And that's having a strong effect on people's um, beliefs about the the trustworthiness of the medical profession. This quote from Michael Trainer, evidence-based practice demands that a much more rigorous and systematic science be applied by practitioners But it's not the science of grand theory and new discovery. It's a defensive attempt to keep harm at bay, a defensiveness that it has been argued has become characteristic of contemporary science. I don't know whether we want to think of ourselves as um, using evidence in that way. The drug industry and evidence-based medicine have set about legitimizing illegitimate diagnoses and then widening drug indications. And now doctors can prescribe a pill for every ill. The billion prescriptions a year in England in 2012, up 66% in one decade, do not reflect a true increased burden of illness, nor an aging population, just polypharmacy supposedly based on evidence. And really my final point that I want to make is that if you look at this slide on the screen, this is just a very brief summary of some of the issues now facing the physiotherapy profession. And however you cut this up vertically or horizontally, You could take any one of these phrases or words and it would be a book length study on what this might mean for the future of the profession. But of course, um, there isn't time to do that. My point here is that evidence-based practice can't actually help us with the big issues that now face the profession. It's the cultural and economic and political and social driving forces that are hidden in plain sight that we need to understand. Evidence-based practice and clinical trials and knowing whether this approach to hamstring stretching is better than that approach won't help us with the big issues that are now facing the profession. And if evidence-based practice increasingly leads towards a greater standardization of care around what is supposedly best practice, then we are at greater risk of decomposition. The idea that our roles will be divided up, the technical aspects will be carved away and will be given to somebody who's cheaper to employ and train than we are. So in effect, evidence-based practice could be leading towards the very decline in physiotherapy that we're all worried about, turning to evidence-based practice for the solution when in fact it might be contributing cause. So evidence-based practice, one of its fundamental problems is that it can't handle the kind of diversity and difference and surplus that always exists in clinical counters that demands that we respond as clinicians, as highly experienced people that bring ourselves to that clinical moment, that require that subjective judgment. That is the reason we have that lengthy training and that experience. That's the reason why we hold that status in society as it is. And evidence-based practice, really threatens that position that we have. 
So I'm arguing in my very brief presentation that rather than accepting that evidence-based practice is the thing at all, or attempting to try and tweak and improve it, we should be asking ourselves in what ways is evidence-based practice violent, abusive, and oppressive for us? Thank <laughs> you.